welcome to Whims and Nonsense, the podcast where I talk about whatever I damn well feel like. And we're forced to follow. Yes, I am joined by uh, longtime friends of me, uh, my good friend, uh... oh crap, that's right, I meant to tell you guys. I prefer using real names, if that's not an issue with you. Eh, that's alright. Whatever. Alright, I'm off. Uh later. Okay. I, I actually can't leave. I'm, I'm chained to the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. He's tying you down. You're gonna talk about Nintendo villains, damn it! Alright, so let's try this again. Alright, we're coming back in three, two... And welcome to Whims and Nonsense, the podcast where I talk about whatever I damn well feel like. And we are forced to oblige. Yes, I, I am joined by longtime friends of myself, uh, my good friend, uh, Steven. Hello. Uh, my other good friend, uh, Abby. Hi. And my third good friend, uh, uh, Dingus. <laughs> friend is a relative term at this point. <laughs> and on today's episode, uh, the inaugural episode of what's probably never going to see the light of day, uh, we're going to be talking about some of our favorite Nintendo villains, all right? Savvy? Yeah. Savvy. 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 Whatever that is. All right, means. And, and I think we can all agree... The best Nintendo villain ever to have ever come out is clearly Bowser. Let's okay. uh, try that again. It is very clearly Bowser. Let's yeah, ignore. Okay. Uh, we seem to be on different pages here. Uh huh. All right. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna be a gentleman. I'm gonna let the lady speak first. So Marty, make your case. What? I don't wanna go first. <laughs> Well, let's let's let let's let Nevels go first. Okay. Fine. Um. All right. Since no one else wants to speak first. <laughs> We're telling you to go first. Go first. I, I was under the impression <laughs> that the lady was going first, so I'm just sitting back saying, "All right, whatever. what is happening?" I don't know, my intro. You're the you're you are the ringleader of all of us. You should go first. Go! Yeah. <laughs> Somebody go. Okay. Oh my god. All right, all right, fine. All right. So the villain I chose for this podcast is from a spin-off series to the main Pokémon series called Pokémon Mystery Dungeon. Now, it's not the most common thing in the world for Pokémon to have like any outstanding villains, but in the Mystery Dungeon series, they actually come up with some villains that are are actually pretty good. Out of what I've seen, at least. So, I chose Dusknor from the second series in the game from Explorers of Sky. Because, long story short, he's kind of a douchebag. Well, I mean, isn't that kind of the point? Well, yes, but he's a, he, he's a major douchebag. Like, lieutenant douchebag. D- does, does, he, Lute- does he impede the mystery <laughs> of said dungeon. I've never played a Pokemon mystery dungeon, so I have no idea what. He does not about. impede the mystery of the dungeon, but he well, tries. He... But he tries to bring the. Wait, the... wait, is he the mystery in said dungeon? At least. <laughs> no, but he tries to bring the world to a- an absolute ruin. So, you know, your general villainy stand fair then. Then, but All right. basically, his main goal is to make the world paralyzed, which essentially means time doesn't, doesn't pass. And you that's that's kind of new. Yeah. All right. And all right. We'll uh, uh, I'll let you save your arguments for a little bit later. Let's move yeah. on to Mr. Marty. What what have you what have you got for us? All right. So uh, I chose Kefka from Final Fantasy VI, which in the United States is Final Fantasy III. And the reason I chose him, well, I guess there's a couple different reasons, but the main reason is that he pretty much achieves his goal. Like it's basically your typical. A, like destroy the world fair but like he's one of the only like villains that I've ever seen in a video game that actually does it and like doesn't like get killed until after he's already destroyed the world I guess so basically you're saying he technically succeeds even though he does eventually die yes okay uh, um, so Steven yeah. you're up All right, so... don't let me down I mean, I chose my main man Ganondorf, and I guess whoever wrote uh, The Legend of Zelda took a page out of freaking Final Fantasy because Ganondorf is also a successful villain, considering that he destroyed the entire world of Hyrule first and ruled it for 
all of a puberty time. Well, yes, yeah, so what I was going to say, which, um, which Ganondorf <laughs> are you doing? Which yeah. incarnation? Uh, oh, yeah, that's right, because the whole multiple timelines thing, right? Uh-oh. And then well, each game is see. its own separate thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll go with Ocarina of Time. It's probably one of the more well-known ones. Okay. All right. But, yeah, so, like, in Ocarina of Time, he actually does what he's supposed to do, and mm-hmm. then Link has to grow into a man, which, you know, takes countless years. Yep. And, uh, yeah, so Gandorf, he does things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and I've got to go with my main man, uh, Bowser. I He technically hasn't succeeded compared to the people like uh, Kefka and Ganon, sure. In the, and as much as his main goal is to what take over the mushroom kingdom yeah but i would argue that he is probably the most successful villain in spite of his repeated failures but i'll save those arguments once we get into the nitty-gritty okay. all right all right so let's go ahead and start with the two guys who you guys say have actually won yeah. essentially all right we're let's start with uh kepka so what was his what was his plan what was his goal i mean Basically, he just wants to, like, become a god and destroy the world. Okay. Uh, pretty no. pretty straightforward. All, All right. right. I'm, not, I'm not too well-versed in the Final Fantasy dumbness. <laughs> uh, so, and, and so you said he succeeds, essentially, before the game in and of itself ends. Before the story ends. Yes. How did he do that? Oh, uh, gosh. Uh, I don't remember... I haven't played this game so long. <laughs> I just remember that he does it somehow. Somehow. <laughs> uh. He collected the seven Dragon Balls, in which he <laughs> also uh, fought Cloud and Sephiroth at the same time, who are conjoined twins, mm-hmm. mind you. <laughs> and as he fought them, he realized the only good power in the world is love and peace, and therefore became the god of love and destroyed the world. Sounds accurate. I mean, Out of his passion for all things and the and the world, of course. Of course, of course. I mean, that didn't. I didn't think that had to be said. I'm sorry. I thought yeah. it went without saying. Well, this is a debate. All well. things must be stated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. Okay. So, basically, like he's this like magician type clown looking guy, and mm-hmm. throughout the course of the adventure, while like the main characters and everything are getting stronger, he also gets like way stronger. And he kind of goes around and, like, sabotages, like, this army. He kills a bunch of people. And then he tries to... I don't remember. Like, he tried to kill somebody. And so, so basically you're saying, as far as, like, typical video game villains go, he's actually surprisingly effective. Yes. Okay. Is he a constant presence in the game? Like, does he keep periodically showing up? Or I think like, so, yeah. yeah. Or pretty. is he just... Okay. Because I know, uh, at least compared to somebody like Ganon, he's just kind of, like, at the end. He's what you're fighting towards? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but, okay. So, and we're going to use this to segue into Ganon now. Because, like, so you said Ganon at- technically succeeds in his in Ocarina of Time, too. In Ocarina of Time, he technically yeah. su- succeeds, yes. Because... Uh, thank um, you for spoiling the rest of the game for me. Yes, yeah, spoiler. We're ever going to get back to it. No, it's... <laughs> We're doing the time warp, man. Um, so yeah, so basically what happens with Ganon is there's this like prophecy with the Gerudos. He's from the Gerudo clan of thieves, which is an all-woman clan. And every hundred years, a male is born, and they name him Ganondorf. It's like a tradition, apparently. All right. So he's like the evil equivalent of Link? Essentially, yeah. Because yeah. every single time Ganon is born... There is a Link equivalent that is also born and also a Princess Zelda by the uh, conjoined Triforceness. Right. So, um, apparently, <laughs> the Gerudos were cursed by this evil god who just is, like, full of hate. That's And he and so every time the Gerudo male uh, is uh, born... Uh, yes. Hatros, of course. Hatros, <laughs> yes. Um, but, so he embodies basically the the male and get and the male is born with the triforce of power which doesn't help because with hatred and power never goes well nah, as far never. as good uh is concerned so 
in Ocarina of Time, you are introduced to Ganon very early on in the game. Like, you just see him, and he, like, looks at you very sinisterly, and yeah, you and already he, know. Yeah, he he's... took did the, the girl princess. Yeah, he took he, did the he girl princess <laughs> at, at one point. No, he didn't kidnap Zelda. He tried he to. Kidnapped someone. He, he, yeah, he was looking for the Ocarina of Time, because he wanted to go grab the Triforce, the right. actual thing of power or whatever. But yeah, so what actually, so he, and to use that, Link grabs the Ocarina of Time and opens what Ganon needed, and because Link did that, Ganon goes in, takes the power he needs, controls Hyrule for however long Link seven. is. Is it seven years? I L- thought Link, so. Link sleeps for seven years. Yeah, you know, enough time for puberty to happen. <laughs> What a lazy bastard! <laughs> Seriously, and I thought he I was slept lazy. through his own puberty. That's that's <laughs> talent. That is talent. Link is a talented young man. He also got his ear pierced at some point during his sleeping. I think I would like to think it was like a wild party, but I digress. <laughs> Probably. No, may- maybe Ganon. He, like he knew where Link was this entire time, and he just went into the temple and f- just started fucking with him. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, and you're going your ear pier- your ear's gonna be pierced. You're not gonna be left-handed. You're gonna be right-handed for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but yeah. So basically, while Link is sleeping for seven years, Ganon has taken over Hyrule, and basically everyone in the game uh, world that you are in is forced to move to this one little village. Everything else is just decimated. <laughs> so. Oh, sounds like a classy fellow. Mm-hmm. All right. Yes. So both Kafka and Ganon ha- have points toward their favor in this, in as much as they they've actually succeeded in at least one of their plots. And mm-hmm. for better or for worse. All right. <laughs> yeah. What about uh, you, Miss Abby? What 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 is your is your character a success story Dusk. or an abject failure? It's interesting because in a way he almost does succeed. Because what he wants wants to do, as said, steer the planet towards paralysis, and since he's and he's from the future, so he already knows what he, what he has to do in order to make the future his you know pinnacle of darkness and whatever. So what happens in the climax of the game is that he takes the hero Pokemon and their partner, you know, he plays a Pokemon in the game, and drags them into the future. And the future is when, when you get there, it's this bleak dark, desolate land. N- morning morning never comes. The wind never moves. It's just silence and this is uncomfortable air all around. It, it sounds like a recurring theme. Yeah. But, <laughs> but then what you discover is that instead of Duskmore just leaving you in a, pr- in a prison cell in the future, is he has plans to execute you and your partner. That you got that at a point you and your partner are blindfolded and then when <clears throat> the blindfolds are taken off, you and your partner are tied to a stockade, and you're about to be ripped to, ripped to shred by his minions. And that's his, his grand scheme to stop you guys from saving the world, is a straight up murdering you guys. Because it's also heavily implied he probably killed anyone else who stood in his way. Because there's this one scene in the game that still has st- st- um, stuck with me this whole entire time, is that you and your partner manage to escape from being executed, and you're running along this, you know, mountainside or whatever, and off in the distance, your partner sees this little collective bunch of lights, the only light you see in the future, and your partner's like, these lights are really beautiful, but it's probably a stockade where more executions are taking place. Like it's just a minor thing that's not really overall uh, relevant to du- to um, Duskmore being an amazing villain, but I think in a way it is because that scene has still stuck out to me. That the only sort of light light you see in the future just means Duskmore is winning because he's killing anyone who stands in his way. Fair enough. All right, and I guess that leaves uh, the big baddie himself, king of all bad guys, I guess, uh, Bowser. And I think it's all... I'm not spoiling anything in the fact that Mario always wins at the end of the game, right? Spoiler alert. Triggered. Trigger warning. But then, you would... The the obvious assumption that Bowser's uh, impetus for doing what he does is to either A, 
conquer the Mushroom Kingdom, be uh, marry Peach for whatever reason, or C, some combination of the two. Or he wants cake. Or some combination of the two. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes, he, so he's never technically succeeded, but I, I'm... I would argue that his motivation is not necessarily for, like, real estate purposes, as you would have been led to believe, mm -hmm. but rather for more nefarious political purposes. Because in as much as however many times Bowser has failed, he is still seen as a credible threat. He's never been successfully eradicated. So the question begs, why? Why can't we ever stop the Bowser? Well, who else would be Mario's arch nemesis? See, but see, that's the thing. Mario's faced numerous bad guys over the over the years who True. have whom have had greater levels of success compared to Bowser. I mean, if you're looking at the Paper Mario series, the first one, Bowser's just being Bowser and he's beaten in typical fashion. But in the sequel, you have the Shadow Queen who comes very, very close to actually winning in the end. It's not for except for the freaking deus ex machina that lets you win. <laughs> right. And then in Super Paper Mario, you, you have Count Black, who literally comes like minutes away from actually successfully destroying the multiverse. Yeah, that, that's true. Count Black was like this close to getting his goals achieved. And he would have succeeded had he not have a change of heart. Right. Because, but whatever. So, it... it it begs the question, why do I consider Bowser to be the most successful Nintendo villain? It's because he's not playing for real estate, he's playing for influence. Just sheer influence. Right. <clears throat> I mean, because in spite of everything, if you're looking at the Mushroom World as a whole, it, taking into account the various games, the Mushroom Kingdom in itself is actually pretty tiny. Oh yeah, it's really not that you know, grandiose of a kingdom. No, yeah, and there, there's numerous other kingdoms that are its immediate neighbors and all that stuff. There's like Super Mario Brothers three, the various Mario RPGs out there. It, it shows that there are ulti there are other essential nations out there that Bowser has no interest in. So why is he constantly focusing on the Mushroom Kingdom? Is the question that needs to be asked. Oh, well, right. Well, he, he. I mean, he wants to marry Peach, so. But does he, though? Why does he need to marry Peach? What is he getting out of it? It's not like well, the Mushroom Kingdom is some big political superpower or anything. Well, that's true, but you're, he's still marrying a princess, and that's some sort of royalty and power he'd be getting. Yeah, he but to. he's already a king. True. He is already a king of his own land. He has legions of, of devoted, loyal followers, and he's got children. He's got eight children already, and he needs to marry Peach because of what? He's clearly already had at least a, either A, a mistress, concubines, or whatever that is producing his heirs. So, what what is he really after? I guess he, in typical villain fashion, just more power. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe he just wants to, like, merge the Mushroom Kingdom and his kingdom together. And maybe Princess Peach is just like, nah, bro. That true. That could be a, a possible goal. I mean, Lord knows he's literally moved her castle numerous into times. Into space once. Twice. Oh. Into twice sp into space. Oh. Mm. Mm. Sorry, but it, either way, it, it's. I, I would argue that Bowser is successful in, in as much as that he's. He's probably the most powerful monarch within the Mushroom World. Because he could pretty much do whatever the damn well he feels like, and the only person who's going to stop him is Super Mario, but even he can't b actually beat him. Right. So I would argue that Bowser isn't acting for any real you know, like meaningful gain. I would argue that he's acting out of sheer boredom. <laughs> probably. <clears throat> and when you're bored... Yeah, and, and when you're bored, anything is entertaining, and when you're entertained, ultimately you win, right? Sure. I suppose. Right? Yeah. Sure. But like, all right. But 
I, like, in the end, if he's still never actually any real threat, then it doesn't, he doesn't seem like such of a scary, super bad guy. He's just some minor annoyance that has to happen every once in a while whenever Bowser feels like it. Other in terms of, you know, Duskstorm, who is trying to create Apocalypse Now. <laughs> but that's true. That was That's his goal. And it's like his goal isn't just for the heck of being evil. It's that he, is that why he's so evil and wants to, um, you know, not want the heroes to succeed. Is that he's afraid of death. That he knows if the heroes succeed and change the path of history by making sure time won't freeze, then he doesn't he doesn't die because his existence will continue on as long as the world comes into ruin. So it's purely selfish and self-sustaining. He's really not doing it for any other good of the world. He doesn't care well, if he's well, the last Pokemon on Earth. I, I, I think that, that that's that's just a given for most villains because they're ult- most villains ultimately act for selfish reasons, though. Right. Whether it's I need to protect myself, the people I love, or what I think I'm doing for the greater good in spite of clearly not greater good I'm doing. Right, but he still think, but he, but I don't think he realizes, you know, making the planet paralyzed is wrong. He's just blindly obeying, um, his, you know, his his boss essentially, because he wants to be, you know, think of like oh I, I'm a useful muck and I can, you know, get the job done, and it doesn't matter what happens. So so I I'd argue that makes him more of a tragic villain than anything else cuz oh. he thinks he's doing good at the end of the day. Right. Tragic he's definitely tragic in, in, in some sense. But another thing is when you fe- when you um first meet Deskmore in the game, he presents himself as like, you know, this really friendly, like super smart explorer and everyone reveres reveres him cuz he you know, he's so smart and knowledgeable and helpful. And like right before he's like he sets up a whole entire lie to say no if you if you guys do all this thing the planet will be paralyzed which is the opposite and right before he leaves the future is when he grabs you and your partner so the whole entire time he fooled everybody into believing that he was good and that when you and your partner get back from the future they don't believe you at first because like but this was a hero why should we be- why should we believe you guys Alright, so I think now we need to move on the argument to what our villains have in spite of their ultimately canonical losses, alright? Okay. So, uh, I think it's no, it's no big surprise that Kefka doesn't really have much going for him in spite of his loss. Hmm. Mm. I don't know, he ends up becoming a god. Oh, that's something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. it's no big deal. No big deal. One of the most powerful beings on the planet. No big deal. In the universe. Yeah. Eh. That's something, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but what, is, what does he do with that? Or does he have an opportunity That's to do like anything with it? what he does. Like, So, I... Uh, from what I remember, he like tries to find this floating continent that has these three statues on it of these like demons that had this big war like a long time ago or whatever. I have a question. What is with all these JRPGs and their fascination with floating continents? Yeah, they look cool. I don't know. They had to show off ah, the cool Mode yeah. 7 graphics of the SNES or whatever. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Well, Mode al- 7. I was going to yeah, say, well. you, you can also ask what the uh, fascination with AR- JRPGs is and um, the main villain being God being defeated by the power of friendship. <laughs> yeah. Ah, but, yeah. like... <laughs> <laughs> the power of friendships also might all gods but yeah so like he finds these statues and he destroys them or, or whatever and then he gains the power to become like the god of magic or some shit like that and then wait whoa 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 whoa, whoa. the god of magic I think so magic <laughs> it's magic cause so he's like, that like, it's like and I'm gonna turn the magic on and I'm gonna turn the magic off Back on! Back off! I don't know. On off! Well, to be fair, a lot of Final Fantasy attacks are magic-based. Yeah. So, if so you turn off magic, like... they're screwed. Yeah. I don't know. So, well, then, like... He gets this power, and then he's like, alright, now I get to 
warp reality and destroy everything, whatever. It's cool. <laughs> and then, like, so he, like, splits the world up into, like, a bunch of pieces and then, like, watches over all these people and people that, like, don't like him or whatever, he just, like, kills them. He just, like, he just, like, sends a gigantic light beam down from his place and it's just like, you're dead. Whatever. <laughs> do, do do the other gods and the, the Final Fantasy Pantheon even care? Because I know there are other ones. <laughs> but, yeah. like, this dude, like, he just became one. He's the newbie of the group and he's <laughs> just doing all whatever he wants. And, these, and the other ones are like, eh, yeah, whatever. Let him have yeah. his fun. Yeah. Well, let, I mean, let, uh, let the new guy do what he wants to do. Uh, to be fair, uh, if comparing it to the Greek pantheon, you know, most of the gods, they didn't really care what each other was doing as long as it wasn't interfering with their yeah. jacked up machinations. I don't know, just killing people willy nilly and splitting up the entire world seems like it could mess with at least one of their problem, <laughs> one of their plans. But gods probably do, do that all the time, so he probably wouldn't be entirely born. <laughs> this is the it's seventh time like, this world has been split. This yeah. week! Yeah. Maybe the sixth. <laughs> Like man, it's like I, you can't plan a vacation in this place anymore. No, we can't. Uh, I I was gonna go to the Bahamas this weekend, but then some space god just took it away. It's just like, <laughs> <"Woo!"> <laughs> fortunate. <laughs> and now the Bahamas is nothing but pebbles. <laughs> oh man. All right. Uh, so Ganon, what are his successes in spite of his overall failure? In spite of his overall failure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, he's got a sword. He can turn into a pig. I mean, like, literally, the only thing Ganon does is he is born every hundred years, and this cycle continues of him succeeding in his plans to take over Hyrule, well, him I, I, being very overconfident and cocky when it concerns Link, and then finally, Link just wins, and then he's vanquished for another like. Well, cycle. Uh, te technically, you're too, you're talking about Ganon from Ocarina of Time, and according to the Zelda timeline, officially published by Nintendo, uh, Link can canonically lose yes, to Ganon. That, that that is true. There is a timeline where Ganondorf kills Link, which leads to uh, Majora's Mask, if I'm not mistaken. Nope. No. When Link gets killed, that leads to the um. Like the first, like the SNES era of games. Oh, so Link yeah. to the Past. Yeah. Okay. I'll Link to the Past. Yeah. I, I'm first not Zelda too. Game. Majora's Mask is on that timeline, but Majora's Mask is supposed to be. Child Link, succeed, child Link succeeding. Yeah. Uh, is it Child Link succeeding? Yes. Yeah, because it's like a direct sequel to Ocarina, mm -hmm. I think. I'm pretty sure. I'm not like, entirely sure. From what I remember, I'm like, he, sure. he defeats it, it, Ganondorf. And then, like, he goes off on some adventure to find someone. Yeah. I just but, know that Majora's Mask is way too depressing to be I, a very was, happy sequel. I, I was under the impression <laughs> that Majora's Mask was basically Child Link being dead. Mm. Like, that that was kind of like, he's dead! Have an adventure! Yeah. Uh, well, but the, no, uh, the, <clears throat> the Zelda timeline is the bait for another time. Yeah, the I, Zelda I timeline is, is in itself an entirely messed up thing. We but, can have a debate about that in the future. All right, or e even still. So, but Ganon's main uh, motivator is just his quest for power, right? Yes. Absolute power. He wants to become part of the gods, basically. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you need to collect all the Triforce pieces. And that I mean, is his only mission. Because <laughs> in most of the games, at least, he, he succeeds in collecting at least two of them, right? Yeah. And he yeah. needs to defeat Link for the third. Yes. Yes. So, um... Uh, so he, if he technically succeeds at the Ocarina of Time, then that's it. He's met his end goal. He wins, only to be defeated in the the follow up. Essentially. Essentially. Mm -hmm. Yes. He will succeed, and then it rinse and repeat. Essentially. So it sounds to me like he's just stuck in a, a, a vicious form of Groundhog Day. It's a very bad time <laughs> for him, man. Every single time he wakes up and hits the alarm clock, he's like, ugh. I have to do this shit again. Maybe that's why it seems like every time he encounters Link in this game, he's just so, like, nonplussed about it. Like, oh, and you're yeah, here. Yeah, this to... shit again. Whatever. Yeah. Let's, let's get this over with. Ah! <laughs> oh, yeah. no. You have defeated me. What a shock. 
<laughs> For real. Because like, that happened been... before. Right? You are the real hero of legend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to sleep. <laughs> oh, See you in a century. Because there's even a part in in the Ocarina of Time that always like I guess got me. At first, I was always thinking that maybe it was because Ganon was, I guess, a, a master tactician. Because remember I said Link got the Ocarina of Time and opened up the temple, right? Mm-hmm. And that's yep. what Ganon wanted. Well, Ganon knew Link had it. Right. But at the same time, I was like, how did he know? He didn't see them throw it in there. There's no way he should have known. Unless he's just rinse and repeating this whole entire thing. He's just like, all right, I met the kid. I know what's going to happen next. <laughs> just get this over with. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god. That's that's unfortunate. So basically Ganon has nothing else going for him. It's either he wins or he's got to do it all over again. Essential. Yeah, it really is. It's I mean, oh, that is that is just really really uh like Dante-esque kind of punishment. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. He turns into a pig. That's cool. I mean, <laughs> 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 All right, uh, Miss Abby. Uh, what is what is? I can't remember his name. Dusknor. What, what are Dusknor? D- Dusknor, <laughs> right? All right. So, what does Dusknor have in spite of his final shortcomings? Well, like I said, I mean, technically he does win at first. The only reason he failed is because your is because the hero and the partner managed to go back in time and convince everyone that Dusknor was evil. If they had failed in doing that job, Dusknor would have achieved his penultimate goal, which is, you know, the pra- paralysis, um, paralysis, of, paralysis of the world. Because, I mean, if, if you think about it, that, you know, you and your partner, here and partner, change the future, which results in a different timeline in which Dusknor is erased from existence because that future isn't going to exist anymore. So, oh, okay. So basically, what happens is he wins, and then, nope, sorry, yeah. that's it, it's over, <laughs> bye. I mean, in a way, it's weird to say. If I think if he didn't drag the hero and the, par- and the partner into the future, they never would have known. So that was his first mi- first mistake. If he had kept the path as set normally, his victory would have been assured no one would have been able to do anything because they wouldn't know the truth. So he sort of set up his own downfall because he didn't see that there were still a few allies in the future that would help you and your partner, would help the hero and the partner get home. So could you say his, like, one major downfall, I guess, was rashness because he didn't think about it. He was like, I want to get this all done over with faster. Yeah, because his goal was like, if I get the hero and the partner out of the way and, you know, tossed in a, in a prison cell and executed, they can't stop the future from happening. When they probably wouldn't have stopped it from happening in the first place if yeah, he had because, never been there. Because they wouldn't know what they, what they were doing, because what they were doing to save the uh, planet from paralysis was wrong, and that they didn't know the correct way to fix it. So even if they knew, oh no, this isn't right, they still wouldn't know how to get to the place to fix it and how to fix it. So, so not only is he a tragic villain, but he's a Greek tragic villain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he is My his God. own downfall. Oh, I don't know how to tell you this, but it sounds like this guy was not very successful at all because not only did he take measures that led inevitably led to his final downfall, but it also led to him unexisting in the process. Yes, but I still think... <laughs> I, but well, I, that's what I think is interesting about him, even if he's not like the most super evil, mustache twirling villain, he's one of the most interesting. Alright, I can give you that, because it's not like, you know, Ganon's very interesting in comparison. Look, man, I, I turn into a pig. <laughs> I have all sorts of bacon for you. Oh, you turn, you turn into a pig? I turn into a god. How about that? <laughs> pig, god, eh. I'm sorry, but if I had I- to choose between a god and bacon... Gotta go with bacon. Ooh. Fair point. I would go for the bacon. Ooh. Bacon that, is delicious. Wait, wait. Uh, nope. Nope. Case closed. Okay. I, I got I got spikes in my back. <laughs> Ooh, you have a lot going for you there. 
Well, I mean, in actuality, Bowser kind of does have a lot going for him in spite of everything. Like I like I brought up before, he's he runs a very successful kingdom, but almost single-handedly. Uh, he's got children, which means he's got a family that that basically has not been messed with in the entire longevity of the Mario series, right? right. And so he's got vast amounts of wealth to fuel his war machine at a whim. And not only that, plus he's basically the only dignitary from the Koopa Kingdom. And as such, he's invited to all the multinational sports events that happen every <laughs> six months. That's, that's true. So it's like Bowser, in spite of all his failure, he, like, like I said, he ne- doesn't necessarily need to win. I, I, it's only when like he actually has big, super ambitious goals that there's something at stake. Like in Galaxy, where he literally tries to take over the entire universe. And comes pretty close, all things considered, if it wasn't for the space goddess Rosalina basically saying, Nope! Yeah. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what else? And uh, Not only that, plus he actually teams up with the hero, quote-unquote, on numerous occasions. That's true. So, in yeah. spite of being seen as the terror of the lands for the Mushroom Kingdom and its people, he's he's still respectable enough to know, like, oh, all right, at least we know this guy can get shit done. So, like, which, Bowser never loses is, I guess, what I'm trying to say at the end of the day. He just never wins. Right. Like, true. You know- well, no, he actually wins when he pairs up with the ba- with the uh, with the good guys, though. Hmm. Right, but he has to. Well, that's kind of more guys. out of. He really can't do it on his own. Yeah, it's kind of more out of necessity, though, right? No, they go to him. He doesn't go to them, though. If Bowser was left to his own devices, he'd be just fine doing whatever else, letting that thing play out. Because hmm. you also have to realize, with the exception of maybe Super Mario RPG. And Super Paper Mario, he has no real reason to get involved. True. Mm-hmm. What All about right. like? Ah, uh... oh, never mind. Uh, and, and that's another thing uh, I almost forgot. Bowser's got other bad guys working for him. Like mm-hmm. he's got a plethora of of villains in his horde. Yeah, I sure. guess horde. He's a hoarding his problem. Policy. Because, like, what, he's got King Boo, which is Luigi's nemesis in his back pocket, I think, in some in some degrees. I don't know. Their relationship is bizarre to me. One's dead, the other one's a turtle. I don't understand it. It's <laughs> kids these days. They send each other Christmas cards. <laughs> That's about it. Some, something about possessing his dead body? I don't understand it. Uh, well, you know. All right. All right. Well, I think we've gone on at length about our particular choices. Let's let's kind of move on to some of the other more notable Nintendo villains, like um, Mother Brain, uh, oh. Samus's uh, ultimate nemesis. I mean, you could also argue Ridley to an extent because he he's got more of an actual uh, a, a more definite history. Right. Ridley, I would say Ridley's more of the rival. Yeah, yeah like the right. arch rival more than a nemesis in a right. sense. Because uh, Mother Brain is the leader of the Space Pirates, and is if I'm if I'm understanding the cor- the canon correct, it's technically a possessed, or not a possessed, but a, like like an infected supercomputer that once worked for the Galactic Republic or whatever they call themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Essentially, it is it, it it's it's basically Terminator, except in space. <laughs> So, oh, and so HAL 9000. HAL 9000, exactly. Like, it literally is, it's like, if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I played the game and I never really, I guess, read up on the canon, essentially. But, like, you're going through this old place and it's just like, when you fight Mother Brain, it's very daunting. And it, it essentially is supposed to be a computer program gone wrong. Mm-hmm. It's- okay. And I think, as such, it, because it is essentially a computer calling the shots, it's pretty effective when it comes to time to like you know the actual intergalactic warfare, right? Oh yeah, because, it's calculated. Because it, it within its machinations, um, it's 
its ultimate goal is to take over the galaxy or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Or or just to be the supreme I think intelligence. Yeah. Supreme ruler, yada yada. I think so. Right. All right, and it he comes pretty close because throughout the uh, the Metroid series, it's something of like a virtual standoff between uh, the the Republic or whatever and the space pirates, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because uh, uh, Mother Brain is technically defeated in Super Metroid, right? Yes. Yes. Like, like Mother actually Brain, defeated. Yeah, Mother Brain's gone after. A Super and Metroid. then uh, Other M undoes all that, right? Mm -hmm. Other M. It didn't undo that Mother Brain was dead. It just kind of prolonged it, I think. Like in Super Metroid, you, it it was confirmed, Mother Mother Brain died, but another M like you got a little bit more backstory. Mother Brain lived for a little bit longer, and then other M finished, and now Mother Brain is again dead. Well, I, I and what well, I would think that that actually stands to reason that why Mother Brain is so effective because it. Because it is necessarily a computer virus, a program, it can technically live on as long as there's something it can attach itself to, right? True. Yeah. So, I'm think my opinion of the overall Metro series until we get another installment, which probably won't happen for like another 25 years. <laughs> uh, other M's good. Uh, uh, Mother Brain will come back. Yeah, and I think there's probably Possible. a little bit more of hints too in the uh, Metroid Prime series as well to to like Mother Brain coming back because in Metroid Prime you're you're not necessarily hired to be fighting the pirates anymore. They're just coming after you out of sheer spite at this point, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Like in Metroid Prime, you you find well because you're on their ship. Uh, technically, they're following uh, Ridley's orders, right? Because, because Prime is supposed to take place after Super Metroid, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh. And so the mantle of command falls onto Ridley, who is probably the most inept general I have ever seen in any video game. That's including uh, Bowser and that sentiment. Yeah, he's uh, he, he's an interesting fellow. <laughs> and he he killed Samus's parents, which. Granted, they never really go into deep detail about. It. They just say he killed the parents. So, uh, don't know how. Probably yeah. Yeah. being with a giant space dinosaur. Well, yeah. <laughs> he does have that going for him. Just a little bit. But I mean, because like, but his actions seem to in, um seem to lead to the fact that Ridley is ultimately trying to restore Mother Brain, though, right? Yeah, because mm. in Metroid Prime, you don't really see a lot of... You don't see a whole lot, I would think. You just know that the uh, space pirates are collecting Metroids, and they're, like, starting to harvest them, in a sense. Yeah. If that's all you really know, but you're, but you know, you're Samus. You're like, ah, space pirates, bad, pew pew. <laughs> um, no, no, Metroids, run away. Oh. Yeah. And then, um, Metroid Prime 2 happened. That was... Well, is very interesting. Isn't Prime Two kind of like self-contained in enough? Like, it, it's kind of its own episode. It doesn't really have anything to do with the it, overarching plot, in a sense. O outside of a couple of Metroids and space pirates showing up occasionally. <laughs> well, yeah. Like, what actually happens is the space pirates are going down to the planet, and they're trying to figure out like what's happening with the planet because they want to like try and see if they can use that power source for Mother Brain. But in that, they end up creating Samus's like evil half, Dark Samus. Right. Ooh. Which? Uh, God. That, forget and Dark and Samus. that that actually brings up an interesting point because Nintendo likes to do that a lot. They like to create dark counterpoints in their heroes because you've got Dark Link, you've got Shadow Mario, Dark Samus, um, Dark Pit, Dark Kefta, a uh, Wolf who's basically a dark counter. Kind of point to a uh, fox. Yeah, it's well, actually, fox. Their entire team has dark counterpoints. If you think about it, the well, yeah, Star Wolf team. Yeah, uh -huh. but that, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like Nintendo is like, okay, we need a new villain. We need a dark counterpoint. And uh, actually, Mario's got like two actually, because he's got one in Wario as well. Oh yeah, yeah right. It, it would. It, which well, begs the question: Is like how what how little creativity can it can Will we let Nintendo get away with? Is what I'm saying. 
I don't know if Wario is necessarily like an evil half. He's just kind of a douchebag. <laughs> well, yeah. he was he was introduced as an evil counterpart, though. I give it about ten more years. It, it, it was it was in later se- when he got his own series that he kind of became his own character, or Wario that is. Right. But um, like it's. I I don't understand the constant need to create a dark counterpoint to your characters. I mean, at least with Star Fox and all, uh, with uh, with uh, Team Wolf. They have different names. For one, yeah, they, yeah <laughs> and and and, <laughs> and, and they they've got some characterization. I think Wolf is probably the most well developed among them. Yeah, Wolf um, and I think Leon probably, but Leon all he's got going for him is I'm an iguana. You Birdman, you my arch nemesis. I hate yeah. you, Birdman. <laughs> and that that's literally about it. <laughs> oh, I mean, Birdman. even with Dark Link, like. Like, the only thing that I was told was conquer yourself, so I, I think if they, like, developed on, like, on what that could, like, mean for a Link of, like, conquering a part of himself, that would make more sense. Yeah, like... But it just Dark- happens in the middle of the, of the water temple, of all the temples, to put Dark Link in. Yeah, it's, I was about and to say that, too. And beat him, and he's, like, an exact copycat of everything. Freaking but, perfect. like... I think they could have done so much more with Dark Link, and I'm really disappointed that they didn't. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, right. I think that's the story. They were the little plot they were going with with him, though. It's like, hey, you're the hero. You, every person has darkness inside. Conquer he, yourself. He yeah, had to have his. Uh, he had to have his Luke Skywalker in the cave moment. Exactly, yeah. and they gave it to him in the water temple, and then he was never heard from again. Yep. Which made no sense, but all right! Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Ocarina of Time! Water, <laughs> reflections, um... Like, like, like oh. but... <laughs> all right, uh, moving really on to other uh, franchises. Couple. We've got uh, King K. Rool for the Donkey Kong series. Yeah. Uh, King K. Rool. You and simple-minded villain, you. By, by far, he's probably one of the most entertaining bad guys yes. in the Nintendo-verse. Oh, I mean, I mean, he had one hell of a boss fight in uh, Donkey Kong 64 where it's a the boxing match. And not, not even so much that he he has some good boss fights under his belt, but so much as so is that every game he's in, he's got a new persona. Like, oh, and yeah. that just makes him the darlingest thing. Because, <laughs> like, in the first game, he was uh, just a typical king character, right? Typical mm-hmm. King K. rule. I want to uh, steal all the bananas. In uh, Country 2, he was a pirate. Country 3, he was a mad scientist. Yeah. And in Country 4, he became a boxer. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's kind of a shame because uh, the Donkey Kong series, at least now that it's being helmed by uh, Retro Studios, uh, they kind of seem to have forgotten about him. I was yeah. about to say, and in, and in returns, he's... Oh. He's replaced by um. Ooga chaka, ooga chaka. I, I forget. I forget who he was replaced. <laughs> they're, by. they're tribal masks. That's that's right. He yeah. he's replaced by a, a a plank of fucking wood as Sha <laughs> Chan. Oh, how unfortunate indeed. And in the sequel, he's replaced by uh, Arctic uh, Vikings. You know, Vikings. Yeah, something like okay. that. Like yeah, penguins or something. I could dig with it. Penguins, polar bears, seals. Free, yeah. I think there were. I think there were walruses? Yeah, I don't remember. I, I haven't really had a chance to dive into that game yet. But, um... Yeah, and it's just a shame because, you know, you, you actually kind of have a somewhat charismatic villain for as much as you could have de- developed him in the time. Uh, and they, he just seems to have dropped off the face of the earth. Yeah. Yeah, it really, it really is a shame. Maybe he's planning something. Something big. Something big. He's coming back with an army of Kremlins. <laughs> Robot Kremlins. Zombie Kremlins? No, he's Robot gonna... Zombie Kremlin. he, Robot Zombie Kremlins. He's God. He's gonna be Cosmonaut K. Rule. Oh, I would love that. Donkey Kong Country in space. Cosmonaut with a K. Space. <laughs> Cosmonaut with a K. Uh, you gotta have the naming theme, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Alright, um, uh, let's see. What I'm about this, Team I'm, Rocket? 
T oh, Team Rocket. God, that did... T I mean... Wait, wait, wait. Okay, hold te on. Te technically, as, as far as I know in the games, te Team Rocket is seen as a credible threat. It's not till the yes. anime that they're kind of no, no, seen no, as a not, joke. Not the doozy a anime kind of parts. Like, well, in... in the, well, in the games, in um, Gen 1 and Gen 2, they are seen as an actual threat. But are Was we really talking though? Team Rocket as a whole, or just Giovanni, the leader? Oh, goodness. And that's well, just with the game. Then if we go to the anime, I could actually make an argument that Team Rocket's a pretty darn good villain. <laughs> um, I guess... Okay, well, state your case. I want to hear this. <laughs> I, I, I was gonna say... I was gonna say... I guess the sticking more to the games in general, since Giovanni is the ringleader, maybe he counts, but I just like putting them as a whole. Because you really never see them re regret... Uh, for the most part, you really never see them regret their actions. They all just tell you they're in it for the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. like how I mean, in the first games they just straight up murder Cubone's mother. Oops. Yeah. Well, you know. Uh, Stuff happens. Gotta have a Pokemon thing somehow. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, when you say <laughs> Team Rocket's an actual credible build, uh, threat in the uh, anime series. Are you talking like the organization as a whole, or just Jesse and James? Oh, I'm talking about the dynamic trio, man. Oh, really? What is your case? I'm go. very interested. Start. Have at it. All right. So first of all, Jesse and James, they may seem as very un unbearingly idiotic pair, right? Uh -huh. They have no intelligence whatsoever. Yes. They figure out who the strongest Pokemon is in the entire series off the bat. And no one believes them. That's oh my case God. one. Alright, alright. I think I know where you're going with this. Not only did they are, are, did they hone in on the most powerful Pokemon in the series, that clearly being Ash's Pikachu, right? Yes. Yeah, clearly some being Ash's Look, we don't need to go about it's an anime. <laughs> I mean, let's. The, 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 the thing. Powers. The Pikachu has brought down living gods in the show, right? Mm. He, yeah, he took. He took down. He he helped take down Mewtwo, mm -hmm. who who was genetically made by Giovanni, to be the perfect Pokemon. That that's what that's what he was made to do, mm -hmm. and he he helped take him down, even though he was battered and bruised. We're not gonna go into that power friendship, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, he helped in the fight to stop the three legendary birds, mm -hmm. and then he helped again when freaking Lugia needed help. So wait, like, wait, Lu isn't that the time one? No, no. that's no. not the time one. Lugia was the is supposed to be the the sea bird, the sea legendary. Bird okay, thing. see, I I I don't know thing one about Pokemon. I can only recognize the big names. Yeah, right. Which which are the ones on the box? <laughs> Lugia was on a box. Wasn't he? He was yeah, on, he was on silver. Yeah, and that's soul silver. silver. Soul silver, soul silver. He also had his own movie, Pokemon 2000. That's probably what I'm confusing it with then, yeah. You know. Okay, and after Pokemon 2000, I've never watched a single other uh, Pokemon movie. But I'm pretty sure Pikachu was the main person who fought, like, let's say, Dark Rai, oh, uh, Arceus. The Dark Rai uh, is a bad guy. Uh, Arceus, okay. who's the god of Pokemon, apparently. I'm pretty sure Pikachu had something to do with that. I'm just saying, Pikachu apparently is like Arceus' like pet po pet project or something because Arceus is just like, how powerful can I make something? <laughs> Pikachu. So what, so what you're saying is Pikachu is the Goku of the Pokemon anime series. Yes. Yeah, Ooh. pretty much. That is a perfect comparison. Oh. Okay. Super Saiyan uh, Pikachu and, confirmed. And so so not only Pikachu has uh, the, the dynamic trio uh, folk figured this out pretty much right off the bat, but... They've also managed to capture him many times. But then Pikachu like, always, always gets free. Well, he, See, he's but Goku. Pikachu gets <laughs> Pikachu gets free not on his own accord. They have they took into account the fact that he was an electric Pokemon. They made things stronger than his steel tail could break. They made his cage Pikachu proof, and they caught him. Yeah. But what always happened was Ash was being a jerk because Ash is too dumb to catch any of the legendary Pokemon and just wants his best friend Pikachu. I don't know why. 
I mean, because he's the Goku. most powerful Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, come on. Ash, Ash doesn't, doesn't know this. What was he need with all the legendaries? Ash doesn't know this, okay? Ash you catch a like, legendary Pokemon, true. the world gets destroyed or some shit in the anime. Exactly. Uh, that's also true. <laughs> so, I, like, to me, these two, how, however much comedic performances they give, they are successful many times. They always have their iconic I'm blasting off again uh, mm -hmm. scheme. But then they also have these other things where they steal everyone's Pokemon around them. And until they see... And it's going perfectly fine. And then they see Pikachu. And then their brain gets turned... Gets flipped from evil genius to... Durr, we need to go capture the strongest Pokemon in the world. And that's when everything goes wrong for them. So I think that they are perfectly credible just villains and threats to the Pokemon world. They just have a very bad time whenever... I think they have, like, PTSD with Pikachu now. <laughs> they just... Every time they, they see him, they just have... They go into, all, like, all they know how to do is capture the Pikachu. Exactly. They can't do anything else. <laughs> Empty your mind. Empty your mind of everything but it's fine, but... <laughs> You know, capturing Pikachu and, and breathing. breathing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's, okay, I can buy that argument. All right. So, uh, yeah. so a anime Team Rocket, maybe w they deserve a little bit more credit. Maybe. Well, okay, right. well Game Team Rocket is essentially just a bunch of gang uh, Pokemon gangsters. All right. Uh, so, uh, other Nintendo villains. Uh, to so we can kind of start writing out this list. Um, Luigi has his nemesis in the form of King Boo. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Luigi, over the past 15 years, more or less, has developed this characterization of kind of being a scaredy cat, but still, in true Mario fashion, getting the job done because it needs to get done, right? Yeah. yeah. So he has in his foil uh, a ghost. King of the ghosts. Yeah. And if you've played either... Really, if you play both of the Luigi Mansions games, you would know that King Boo is probably one of the most credible threats in the Mushroom Kingdom that has ever been. Uh, because he's a ghost, he can't die, right? Right. Yeah. So, in a technical sense, he can't be stopped. It's not if not for Egad's portrait thing, Majigger. Poltergeist. Right. So, and Close not enough. only that, plus he he's powerful enough to have kidnapped Mario twice. Oh, true. M Mario, the the superhero of the Mushroom Kingdom, kidnapped, <clears throat> kidnapped, imprisoned, and then taunted at in wrecked. both games. Get wrecked. And on that, plus he also has some unearthly, undead, cosmic ghost powers that allows him to change the very fabric of reality. Well, hmm. well, well those are your th them ghost powers. And he's only relegated to two games. Yeah. It's Yeah, I mean He is too powerful for for this um mortal sphere. I think that's what Nintendo was going for, is let's yeah. create this really powerful villain and have him be stopped by the seemingly weakest hero of our of sure the he, Mushroom Kingdom. Sure that he had strength all along. Well oh. it's not it's not like he can actually do things he's particularly skilled at, like the running and jumping and everything else that he's that he's otherwise well known for as being a Mario brother, right? No, they give him a vacuum cleaner and tell him, get to work. <laughs> uh, clean up this place, mister. I want it spot clean by the time I get home in four days. Uh, oh boy. I, I, we're missing a villain, aren't we? I'm thinking. Uh... I can bring up a not while well, you guys think I could bring up another villain that technically it's like a Final Fantasy type villain. Uh, is, it, with, is it a Final Fantasy villain? No, it's not. <laughs> it's uh, Sigma from Mega Man. Oh, Doctor Wily. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's and, right. And that game Wiley. we did once. That game we did once. We can uh, Doctor Wily and Sigma are both villains from. I guess Doctor Wily would probably be the better villain to argue because. Mega Man was entirely Nintendo. Like, the Mega mm -hmm. Man series was nothing but Nintendo. Mega Man X yeah. had it split off. So if we argue Dr. Wily, Dr. Wily was a pretty uh, interesting villain, if I do say. <laughs> he pretty much 
stole the idea from Dr. Light. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. He, mm-hmm. uh, he steals Dr. Light's ideas. And, it, and he basically corrupts them to make the... Uh, the Robot Masters. Yeah. Yeah. Corrupts them and, and weaponizes them, essentially. Which, and gives them yeah. the most creative names. Gutsman. <laughs> <laughs> well... I guess when you have to make a giant robot robot army, making names is a, you know a fourth is well, you know, an afterthought. You also have to understand right. English isn't his first language. That's true. It's not. <laughs> but also, I mean, you're making robots, so it's like, how creative of the names can you get? It's like, all right, robot X forty nine, go over there. A robot. Yeah, I mean, X after a while, 50. you're gonna run out of names, so it's best <laughs> to keep a you know a safe, a safe naming pattern. A safe, simple naming pattern. Something bad. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> but so Dr. Wiley essentially would have won, right? Mm-hmm. He would have won if Dr. Light or or if I should say if Mega Man didn't decide to entrust his more human heart because he's a flippin' androidish thing mm. and or I don't even know what he is. It's not even an android, it's a cyborg, I think. He's a super fighting robot, Mega Man. <laughs> Here to save super the world! Fighting robot. It's like, he, I forget, was Mega Man, like, a boy with po- robot parts, or was he a robot built to think like a human? Was um, he technically AI, essentially, I guess is what I'm getting I at. I think so. I, I, I believe he was a ro- he's a robot first and foremost. Yeah, yeah. so he's essentially AI. <laughs> Yeah. As we would like to think of it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so Mega Man be, get, having some self-righteous uh, programming so, built into him. So ba- so basically, the only reason why Mega Man wins is because he has a conscience. Yeah. Essentially. And the uh, amazing copy ability, which I don't remember how it's explained. That's who we're missing. We're missing King Dinity. Oh, uh, copy. Uh, I got that I segue. <laughs> Well, I mean, because throughout uh, the Kirby verse, I think the more credible villain of the series would be O2. Oh. Um, uh, from uh, the Nightmare in Dreamland and uh, Kirby 64. Uh. If I'm correct about that. Uh, uh, basically, his entire MO is to take over the dream world and then later the universe. For Because, well, let's face it, what, you're a villain. What else are you going to do? Yeah, that's true. Uh, 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 as far as you know, he's not really as iconic as opposed to somebody like DDD or Meta Knight, at least in terms right. of the Kirby verse. But um, it it it's interesting in the fact that he's probably one of the darkest villains that Nintendo has ever made because he's kind of terrifying. Yeah, he. I just uh, looked him concept. up. He looks kind of scary. <laughs> Like, cause I mean, because I mean, Ganon's got the whole pig wizard thing going on. Bowser's a dragon turtle. Is this thing you know? crying blood? Yes. <laughs> yes, it In is. In a Kirby game? Oh my god. <laughs> it's, 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 it's crying ketchup. We gotta censor it. <laughs> we, gotta for censor for the ki- we gotta censor for the kids. Yeah, because there's a lot of kids that to be listening to this. I, I, I was referring to the, um, you know, <laughs> to four kids. crying ketchup. <laughs> You yeah. know, oh. but uh, and especially compared to people like DDD, who's kind of a joke, all things considered. Yeah. Because okay. he's uh, he's only a real credible threat in like the first Kirby game, more or less, mm-hmm. and that's I about it. More, more of um, you know, a comic relief villain. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to say like, isn't his whole shtick is I don't like Kirby. Let me try and murder him for the first one, and then after that, he's just a nuisance from there. Either on. that, or he's really hungry and ends up taking Kirby's cake. <laughs> and then Kirby's is like. He's like, fuck you, I want my cake back. And guy well, cuts a bloody swath through the world to get it back. Because, <laughs> I mean, in Kirby 64, he's his friend. So, yeah, begrudgingly. Yeah, and in, like, Return to Dreamland, too, I think. And begrudgingly. Then, like, <laughs> they still are friends, is the point. It's funny because... Begrudgingly. <laughs> it's funny because... Yeah, There's so many times you can throw around begrudgingly until it just starts panning out to, okay, man, you like me, I get it. <laughs> But begrudgingly, though. <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's also we could take a look at some of the uh, not so obviously Nintendo franchises because 
stuff like Castlevania, uh, the villain of that series is Dracula. Um, Dracula. Because uh, the first four entries of the series were Nintendo-based. It wasn't until the PlayStation where uh, Konami jumped ship, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you have this villain, Dracula. Everybody knows who Dracula is. Yeah, you know, of course. The, the vampire, the cape, spooky the, vampire. The, the thing with the hand that just uh, hypnotizes people. Mm-hmm. That's cool. I, I think it's interesting within the Castlevania games, uh, some of a, uh, Dracula's lackeys, because he's got like people like Medusa, Frankenstein, Death himself working you know, for him. All the standard fantasy villains. Yeah. yeah, but I, I, I find it hilarious that Death is taking orders from the Dracula. Could you argue Maybe that it's... it's because Death can't harm Dracula? Ooh. Since, he's, since he's undead? Yes, but then the, by that token, he also can't harm... Uh, uh, there's, there's another one in, in his stable, but I can't remember who it is, though. Well, maybe the, they're just a group of evil buddies who have, like, you know... Evil poker night or something, and they all yeah. decide, hey, you know, look, look <laughs> at And the Simon beds. Bell not just crashes the party, like, <laughs> yeah. why wasn't I invited? And just starts whipping them. <laughs> Dude! That's exactly what happens. Uh, you, you, you gotta keep him away from the booze, man. It's really violent. <laughs> it's uh, not strip poker Monday, it's Texas Hold'em Tuesday. <laughs> um. Wouldn't it be like Strip Poker Sunday or something? I'm sticking with what I got. Okay. No, you can't do that on a Sunday. Saturday, yes, but not a Sunday. Then, okay, Strip Poker Saturday and Texas Hold 'em Tuesday. <laughs> Monopoly Mondays, of course. Better, oh, yeah. What better way to start the week? <laughs> Been hating all your friends. Exactly. <laughs> Alright, so we got Dracula on the roster for. Um. Gratilda. Oh. From the Banjo Kazooie games. Uh, yes, oh, yeah. yes. I was gonna uh, say, there's a bunch of different villains from all of the yeah, Fire Emblem series, but there's so many, it'd be hard to pin down just one particular. particular. Yeah, because uh, Rareware a- actually has a great history of creating some really entertaining villains. I mean, Grunty speaks in rhyme the whole entire game. That is very impressive. Uh, she speaks in rhyme for the first game, right? Yeah. There's, there, there's a thing in the sequel that's like, cut that shit out! And she's like, oh, fine. Whatever. Oh, yeah, well, but, you, but my point is, she could keep going on with it. Oh yeah, I know. The writing for her is fantastic. I and love what's it. what's the greatest thing is the escalation of what is at stake from the first game to the second game. Because from That's the first true. game, her entire plot is, I need to be the fairest of the land, so I'm going to steal the beauty of the fairest in the land and make it my own, right? Right. She, she, I mean, she just it, wants to be pretty. It's it's pretty typical fairy tale esque stuff, right? Mm-hmm. The, and so Banjo Kazooie, they defeat her and whatever. Then some time passes. She comes back in the sequel, and the entire stake is sucking the life out of the world entire. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, that she had a lot of time to think when she was underground, man. And uh, the pressure of the dirt got to her. <laughs> it, 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 it's just so ludicrous, like how. <laughs> drastically different the tone between the first game and the sequel is and it is just a two year gap because when the first game came out people uh, uh, like it's now since hailed as a classic most people at the time saw it as a Mario 64 knockoff right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like it was a very family friendly kind of fun-esque adventure you know much in the, in the vein of the Donkey Kong series and some right. of their other uh, work like the early Conquer games. And then you turn around in, what was it, it was either 99 or 2000, in the sequel. No, it's 2000. Mm-hmm. A- in the sequel, and then it starts off by literally killing off one of the main characters of the first game. Yeah, that Oops. was so sad. <laughs> it, it's just such a sheer turnaround. It's like somewhere after 1998, Rarer had a thought, is like, you know what, we're too family friendly. Let's turn it up to 11. Let's start killing a bunch of our characters. <laughs> <laughs> because the same thing happened with uh, Conker's Bad Fur Day. Oh, oh God. And, and speaking of comical villains, Conker has, what, two in that game. He's got the Panther King, who's really has nothing to do with the plot whatsoever. 
He's just kind of a vague antagonist. And then you have his right-hand man, who literally creates Nazi teddy bears. Oh my Nazi God. teddy bears. <laughs> this game. Well, it's also the Great Mighty Pooh, which is, you know, just a singing pile of poop. Yeah, but thing is, get, the thing is that he was just minding his own business, and the next thing you know, this squirrel wanders into his home. I know, but he gets points for at least the most you. unique, vi interesting villain I've ever seen. Yeah, um, he is the great and mighty Pooh, and he will throw his shit at you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't and, mess uh, with him. And yeah. as far as uh, recent villain entries go in the Nintendo verse, we have. Uh, probably one of my more favorite games of recent years, The Wonderful 101. Oh, yeah. uh, I don't know if any of you guys have played it. I haven't played I it, but I've heard good things about it. Right, I've uh, heard it was wonderful. Yes, hey. quite. Um, the entire idea behind the game is that um, you're basically in charge of a team of people and tasked with protecting the world from an alien invasion for the third time. And and it goes on, and uh, the way the writing is, it's some of the most oh, tongue-in-cheek, over-the-top parody. Oh, you can probably call it a uh, loving homage to like oh, the old monster, Jap the old Japanese monster movies and Power Rangers and stuff like that, with the giant okay. robots and monsters. And um, the main villains in this game make up the this this confederacy, more or less, uh, called Geth Jerk. And they each have their own well-fleshed-out backstory. And chief among them is this a guy named uh, uh, Prince Vorkin, who's probably the, the most uh, charming uh, villain Nintendo has produced in recent years. Well, tech it's technically Platinum Studios, but mm -hmm. Nintendo nonetheless. And because he's basically uh, a fallen prince from a, from a conquered world by these guys who's been tasked to help with the invasion, right? Mm -hmm. and, and every time you encounter him, he and the main character, uh, Wonder Red, constantly get into a dialogue trying to just basically have him explain his backstory only to be interrupted by the contractual obligation to fight one another. Okay. And, and as it's going on, it, it, it is so clear in the writing that uh, Prince Vorkin is only doing this because he needs somebody more or less to defeat him. And the way he's going about it is very much, you know, like, I don't take you very seriously as a credible threat. So I'm going to toy around with you for an hour and then just go on about my business. Have a nice day. <laughs> and then you go on to fight more giant monsters and all this. It's really a fantastic game full of a bunch of fun and colorful characters. Hmm. Yeah. Very colorful. Yeah. It sounds good. I'd play it. Yeah, one day. After I pick up hey. Splatoon. I am. I'm kind of running out of villains to talk about. Did F I think did, we covered. Did F Zero have a villain? Uh. Yes. Did it? Oh well, yes. It, aren't there racing games? They are, but I was gonna the say GameCube the one, uh, yeah. Isn't the enemy the, the enemy GameCube key? one had a villain? Yeah, Black Rhino. Black Shadow, I think. Black Black Shadow Black something. Yeah. Don't quote me on the second the part of his racist. name, but he was the villain. I don't remember what his purpose was, what his objective was. To, don't, um, install to be a speed an limit. asshole. <laughs> to install a speed limit, yes. <laughs> in a video game about going over 200 miles exactly. per hour. Exactly! How is that the... not a, How is that, like, not the requirements for, like, like, the ultimate bad guy in a racing game? You must go 30 miles per hour. <laughs> so, he is apparently um, the king of evil. Black, black Black Shadow? Shadow? According to this. It, black, this black is a Shadow. racing game. Yes. The, the literal king of evil. The king of evil is I racing. racing game. I <laughs> take that back. Bot. There is another racing game that actually has a villain in it, and that's Diddy Kong Racing. Whiz Pig. Oh, yeah. He's got the evil pig wizard. Yeah. <laughs> get, 
He, know, he may or may not be related to Ganon. I don't yeah, know. No, well, you know. Ganon gets around, man. He's got a whole millennia to think out how he's going to change his life. <laughs> it's but, like, one time he, he comes out of his otherwise coma, and it's just like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to take up racing. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say, but like, I can't remember Wizpig, Wizpig doing any actual villain villainy. Uh, his villainy is like more more or less just kind of like t- mind controlling uh, people and just being a general nuisance. Because the uh, the quote unquote plot of the game is that uh, uh, Timber the Tiger. It, it, this is all taking place in his home world or home area, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Which is like down the street from the Donkey Kong Country. <laughs> Uh, and the whiz pig uh, basically invades while his parents are on vacation and says, This is mine now! Race me to defeat me! <laughs> <laughs> and wow, then you're just right. told to go at it. Like, you don't even know that much. That's just what they say in the manual. Yeah. <laughs> Remember manuals, guys? Yeah. Oh <laughs> I feel old. I miss them. I did think of one other villain that we may or may not have skipped over. Um, All right, and, and this can be our last villain of the night. Go ahead. So, we didn't talk about Andros. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh. That's right. Mr. Space Monkey Head. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Spake Monkey. Spake? Yeah, that's what he is. <laughs> Spake Monkey English. Head. Spake Monkey Head. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Let's dial it back a bit. So Andros's deal was he's an evil scientist that got banished to a planet, mm-hmm. and then he killed Fox's dad, and Peppy won't let Fox forget about that, <laughs> and, and as far as I know, Andros is just trying to get back at the Republic for banishing him. Tell as far as that. I know, his whole thing is a revenge story. Yes, okay. And, um... When did he become a giant head? Sometime between his banishment and after killing Fox's dad. Okay. Because, is like, I've only ever played Star Fox 64, right? Yeah. Right. So, that's the extent of my Star Fox canon. And that's uh, honestly do, the extent of the Star Fox canon. <laughs> do, do, do they, do, when the Star Fox team goes in to fight Andros, do they know he's a giant head? Or is it just kind of like, oh my god, Surprise! he's a giant head! Surprise! <laughs> I think it's honestly a surprise, because I don't think... I mean, if I was in that universe and everything was in space, I would not expect a giant floating head to fight. And then, and when you beat it, when you beat Star Fox sixty four in the hard version, or the hard route, and you unlock the true ending, not only is he a giant head, he then becomes a just a giant floating brain that shoots electricity at you. Oh yeah, it's even weirder. Yeah. Hmm. So all in all, Andros is like a space monkey deity, apparently. <laughs> Space monkey deity. He's a floating only, head. Only in Nintendo. <laughs> he's a floating head, and he's smart, and he just went mad with science. Yeah. And, and then he got into his own head a little bit too much. A little. Just uh-huh. a teeny tiny bit. I'm oh good. Uh, I think it's safe to say that as far as uh, company made villains go Nintendo has got a both a great and bizarre track record with making yeah, villains because because if you compare it to other franchises that are not Nintendo as far as recognizability you've got like what Eggman for Sonic Bowser um, G- Ganondorf Team Rocket um, I'm trying to think of other non-Nintendo based villains and I'm coming up dry in a lot of cases because m- most of the villains are either you know big kind of like organizations, armies or whatever with uh, no real defined head per se Yeah. 
mm-hmm. or uh, otherwise, you know, just kind of like one off. Uh, uh, I guess you could argue Wesker from the Resident Evil series. Mm. You could argue, but he, yeah, he's the head of the overall Umbrella Corporation, which right. you don't figure out until several games into the series. Yeah, and then for like for to strengthen your one-off example, Metal Gear Solid. He all his villains are literally construed into just that one game, if I'm not mistaken. It's like every single game he has a new villain. Maybe from an overrising or overriding like corporation, like we're saying. Yeah. But it's like they're shelling out like new villains every single right. time. Yeah, because m- most video games these days they're pretty, they're pretty much all entirely self-contained. So you don't really have the ability to develop, you know, long-term villains with long-term goals. Yeah. Yeah. Because right. like, like e- even within the realm of stuff like Final Fantasy, we're like what fifteen games into the series now. Mm-hmm. Getting there. And, yep. and outside of maybe two or three games, are there ever returning villains? Yeah. And you, you know what? That's a tragedy because a hero is only as good as his villain because right. he's only as <laughs> successful as however high the stakes are. And you're going to, you know, if it's more of a, you know, like, huge stakeout battle between the hero and the villain, you're going to remember it more as the hero defeating this big penultimate bad guy at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's just like James Bond. He would be nothing without his uh, megalomaniac uh, supervillains. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, where where would Superman be without the Lex Luthor? Right. They've oh. just been, uh, I guess, carpentmentalized into overall ideas rather than actual villains. Right. That's true. I will save the world and defeat villain A in order to do it. Yeah. And then after that happens, villain B will come up maybe, or maybe villain yeah. A will come back, who knows. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that's going to do it for this episode of Whims and Nonsense. I think we're all in agreement that, yes, in fact, Bowser is the most successful villain of all time. Why do you have to win? Because it's my that. show. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> oh, I'm, so that's us signing out. I am your host, Zach Uri. And I will see you next time, maybe? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I want to leave the couch now. Yeah, can we please, Can you please <laughs> let us go? We've been trapped here for uh, days. Somebody said help. <laughs> He's no. had us bullets and point all of our arguments. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I just Googled my villain like ten minutes before we started. <laughs> I kind of figured that's what you were doing, honestly. <laughs> I've never played At least I came prepared. <laughs> I oh. came prepared-ish. Ganondorf. <laughs> Ganondorf. <laughs> ah, yes, Ganondorf. And his most famed counterpart, the the, the legend of Zelda. I love it's Zelda. It's my monk. favorite Pokemon. Oh, God. Gotta go fast. <laughs>